Several times a week, I receive an email from a desperate 12 to 16-year-old girl who's having issues about her weight. No, let me rephrase that. Her issue isn't about the number on the bathroom scale. The issue is how she feels about herself. Typically, the girl who writes to me hates her body and the way she looks. Then the guilt by association thing sets in, and the next thing you know, the girl hates herself. Here are some recent examples. Hey, Annie. I'm a junior in high school, and let me just start by saying being a junior sucks. It's not just the year itself, but me that seems to be the problem. Then there's the whole body image thing. I know, I should be happy with what I've got and blah blah blah, but I still wish I could get out of the training bra section. It's so awful having friends tell me that they wish they didn't develop and I should be happy that I'm flat as a board at 16. Or this one. I know that I need to lose 10 to 15 pounds because I'm 5 foot 3 and weigh about 130. I think that is too high. All my family members say that I'm a little overweight and I'm embarrassed every time they talk to me about it. Maybe I don't need to lose that much, but I still need to lose some. Or this. I'm very perplexed. I think I'm fat when everyone tells me I'm not. I'm bulimic, but no one knows. How do I stop? Because every time I do try to stop, I feel guilty and I become worse. I'm 12 years old and I weigh 75 pounds. I still think I'm fat. Should we be surprised that these girls are so unhappy with themselves and so out of sync with reality? Considering that they're growing up in a thin, obsessed culture, it would probably be way more surprising if they didn't feel this way. So what's been going on with American girls and women since the early 60s that causes this crippling dissatisfaction with our looks? What does the steady rise in eating disorders, which now includes men and boys, say about our society and our values? And how do we get over it already and help our daughters and sons do the same? I'm Annie Fox, and this is Family Confidential, Secrets of Successful Parenting. Today's show, My Life Sucks and It's Because I'm Too Fat. My guests today are Carol Normandi and Laura Lee Rourke, authors of Over It, A Teen's Guide to Getting Beyond Obsessions with Food and Weight. Carol and Laura Lee are co-founders of Beyond Hunger, a nonprofit organization in San Rafael, California, that provides support groups, workshops, and education for individuals with eating disorders and body image disturbances. They're also the co-authors of a groundbreaking book for adult women entitled It's Not About Food, Change Your Mind, change your life, and your obsession with food and weight. Welcome, Carol and Laura Lee. Thank you. Thank you. I want to tell you how much I've really enjoyed reading over it. And I know you have a newer book out that's for adults, Mm -hmm. but I'm really glad that you gave me an opportunity to read this one because I work with teens. And I want to talk a little bit about the message in here but also what parents can do, warning signs and things like that. Because I get an awful lot of email from teens from around the world who are echoing, all different cultures, echoing this dissatisfaction with their bodies and blaming everything that goes wrong in their life with the way they look. And moms just seem to be feeling very helpless about it. They see these signs in their daughters and they don't know what they can do to help. So maybe we could start with how you got involved in this work. So uh, Laura Lee and I both recovered from our own eating disorder. Uh, I was a bulimic and I became obsessed with being fat in high school, even though there was no reason to, but that's, I sort of internalized the cultural messages. And when I went into college, I became a full fledged bulimic. So it was through my recovery process that I began to realize that most of the traditional interventions at that time that were purely behavioral, 
change this behavior, change that behavior, didn't address the reasons that were causing the issue. Did you go through some of those traditional treatments? I did. I did all kinds of dieting and and diet programs and I, I mean so many of them and and none of them stuck, none of them worked. And it wasn't until I got into group therapy and then individual therapy where I started realizing that the problem was not really about the food at all. It was about how I felt about my body, how I learned to hate my body, how I learned not to listen to my own voice and my feelings and my authentic self. So that's where my recovery led me to. And then I met Laura Lee, who at the time was doing her own groups. Yeah. So I came to um, do this work by um, suffering with my own eating disorder that started around 12 or 13 and I was put into modeling school at a very young age, and I was a naturally thin person. But what happened is Twiggy came out, and so the model became that that was the very first waif model. So the models had to become extremely thin, knock kneed, uh, no hips, no breasts, and basically a child's body. And so along with all the other models at that time, all the teen models, we were all put on diets. And uh, so that just stayed with me and stayed with me and stayed with me. So like Carol, I tried everything I knew how to recover, but it wasn't until I just simply accepted my body the way it was, stopped dieting and looked at the reasons underneath the eating disorder that I was able to get well. It sounds so simple when you say that. <laughs> yeah, all, all I needed to do was accept yeah. my body for what it was, stop dieting, and essentially live my life with a different focus. And right. and I know it's not simple at all, but it's it's interesting to me that this comes up for girls mostly, ages twelve to fifteen, where people start having these feelings of dissatisfaction. Where do you think that comes from? Well, uh, one thing that you said that was really interesting is that these girls are blaming everything that happens to them on their bodies. And that just also describes American women are just women in this culture. You know, I can't only say it's American, but it's, uh, this is where, this is the pool, the pond that I live in. So, you know, we'll blame the loss of a job on our body. We'll blame the divorce on our body. We'll do... Well, you what know. is with that? I mean, let's let's really talk about that. Is, is this an is, is it too much to say this is an anti female culture that makes us tend to personalize everything in that way? I would say we are suffering from a world history of oppression of the feminine, and that we have embodied that hatred and embodied how interesting yeah so in the long term in the long haul picture it goes all the way back to when the matriarchal culture was taken over by the patriarchal culture and we no longer had sacred images of women and women's bodies and the woman's body was be started to be treated like an object and then as we continue on women don't have any rights it, it's only recently that we've actually had the ability to vote only recently that the laws were changed where we weren't property of men in this country. So it's no wonder that we've internalized the hatred and the oppression and that our self-worth has been based on beauty because there have been no other values that have been mirrored back to us. Interesting. Right, and the beauty in this culture is extremely young and thin and perfect. And, you know, you can't do that forever. <laughs> I mean, you just... Sooner or later, you're going to get older, and you're going to get um, maybe not so blonde anymore, and you're going to get a little round, and that's just the way it is. And so, but we don't we don't accept that. You know, we want everyone to be thin, beautiful, and young. And when you say we, what are you thinking of when you we say the we the culture? We the culture. That's the pressure. So, a book like yours called Over It, A Teen's Guide to Getting Beyond Obsessions with Food and Weight, is really a counterculture message. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, this movement goes all the way back with Susie Orbach, who wrote Fat as a Feminist Issue. Absolutely. When we talk about 
not dying anymore. We are talking about taking back the fundamental wisdom in our bodies of knowing when we're hungry, when we're full, when we're satiated. And yes, this is a simple concept, but for years, women have been taught not to listen to trust their bodies. They've been taught to put their babies on a feeding schedule because the doctor told them, instead of listening to the baby's own crying and listening to their incredible bodies responding to the baby. So it is radical and counterculture. Yes, and it's not accepted very much by the medical model or the male model, should we say. It's not a diet. We're an anti-diet. And we are more about your body knows how to eat. Your body knows what it wants. Your body knows when it's done. Your body knows how to move. Our bodies know everything. You know, We should and, be listening more. Yes, but we're taught to listen outside of ourselves. And I really love how you guys talk about in the book, babies don't need to learn this. Right. Babies know this intuitively. And so it seems that somewhere in the process, we unlearn it. And then if we follow the wonderful pathway that you illuminate here in the book, we then can relearn it. That's right. So why are the messages telling us, why are our own moms, why are our own moms trying to help us and encourage us to unlearn something that is so basic and natural? Because our moms have been taught the same thing. Probably even more so. I mean, you, you go and have a baby now, and the mother's has absolutely, has absolutely new, no power in our parents' generation of choices around having a baby. So our mother's generation it was much worse in terms of their ability to have a voice and, and speak their own truth in relationship to their bodies. So we're coming back. But the beautiful thing about learning to listen to your hunger and fullness is that it's not just about eating. It's also about your emotional life, your spiritual life. From very early on, we're put in a classroom and we're taught when to sit, when to move, when to eat, when to speak up. And we, unless we're in a creative learning environment, we really learn to disconnect from our own internal sense of truth and where that moves us. So what we're talking about is not just learning to refeed ourselves with food, but with everything else. Yes. And, you know, again, I was thinking about me being born in 1951. My mother at that time, what was popular was the timed feeding. So I would cry, but maybe because it wasn't 10 o'clock yet, I didn't get fed until 10 o'clock. And oh. then I didn't get fed again till. 12 o'clock. And then I didn't get fed again till two o'clock. And it didn't matter whether I was hungry or not. This is very young. This is a tiny, tiny baby. And then later, my son was born and he's 39 years old. And I had to go against my doctor to say, you know, I think I should just feed him when he cries, don't you think? And what was the message from the doctor? What was the rationale medically? Well, medically is that this is how they have decided that babies get fed the best. <laughs> They and have decided. Yes. And were there any babies on the board deciding this? <laughs> no. And the other thing is formula was the big thing then. And if you loved your baby, you'd feed it formula, not breast milk. That's like for poor people or ridiculous, you know, like tribal people mm -hmm. or certainly not me, you know, or anybody I knew. So it, it was this uh, conforming to the greater authority that was done and it's still done today i mean women girls do things that they don't know why they do that but the, somebody told them that they had to do that so they do it it seems that girls tend to be socialized in a very compliant way yes and when you were describing the traditional classroom about sitting still and following directions girls traditionally for the most part do very well in classrooms. Well, most elementary school teachers are women. So I almost think that it was designed in a way to, to keep order, to be cooperative, and to literally keep everyone on the same page. And usually the squirmy worms in the classroom in the lower grades are boys. Yes. I mean, there are, there are certain books out there now about raising boys that, that try to counter the message that boys are not defective girls, because they don't fit into this, this system. But this idea of socialization, as you say, taking back our emotions and our right to speak up for ourselves on all kinds of issues, not just the way we look. Right. Yes. 
And how how many boys are pu- are told that they are ADD and then they're put on medication at very young ages because they are squirmy and wormy, you mm-hmm. know? And how many little girls are labeled depressed because they're more quiet and... Or they're so emotional. Or they're, they're so, so emotional. emotional, right. So they're put on some kind of medication because they're too dramatic and too out there. So, you know, we, again, I say we, but it's like, because we are all part of this culture that... We have to look at these things. What are we doing to our children? And what have we been doing to our children all this time? So I'd like to go back, Carol, to your um, epiphany during your recovery. What I'm hearing groups, I'm hearing um, a very non-traditional approach to getting over it. It sounds like you worked out your own path in this. Well, I did. It's interesting because... Laura Lee came to the non-diet approach through reading some really powerful women in this whole recovery movement, Carol Hirschman and Jane Mentor and Janine Roth and the pioneers of the non-diet movement. And I wasn't exposed to those books. I went into group therapy. I went into individual therapy. And I also worked at a place called the Center for Attitudinal Healing, whose main philosophy was not judging and approaching everything with love. So that's how I integrated the non-diet approach. I stopped judging my body. I stopped judging what I ate. And I just really started approaching everything with love and acceptance. And it brought me along the same path. And so when Laura Lee and I met up, we had the same philosophy that had just gotten there through different venues. You say you stopped judging. I know all of us have very active little judges who live in our our heads. Um, I have a a series that I'm, the first two books are out now, and book one of this middle school confidential series is called Be Confident in Who You Are, and I introduce a fictional character called the Opinionator, and the Opinionator is this voice inside your head that is critiquing everything, other people, everything you do or say, whether it's okay or not, and I'm wondering how one goes about the process of tuning it down. I don't think we can ever, you can correct me if, if you've a different experience, ever tune it out completely. But just so that it's not broadcasting so loudly, how do you do that? Well, How did in, you do that? In, when, <laughs> in Beyond Hunger, we've created a number of steps. And those steps were based on our own recovery when we really sat and looked at what worked for us. And the first step is having compassion. That it's so important to be able for us to understand that We're in this situation with an eating disorder that has a lot of shame for a reason, that we've learned these behaviors, whether it's overeating or undereating or obsessing or purging, as a way to take care of ourselves. And and that's really important because the next step, which is absolutely vital if we're going to stop judging ourselves, is coming out of denial and being aware and being conscious in the moment And this is the key step to stopping judgment. We have to be able and willing to show up and to look at the internal dialogue in our head. And this is one of the most frightening parts of my recovery, because when I showed up and listened to it, I was so hateful. I was so angry to myself. Mm -hmm. It was frightening to see how much rage and anger and hate I turned into myself every day. You seem like such a sweet person. I bet you everyone had you on the top of their list of the sweetest person they knew. Probably, but inside I was raging at myself. And so really the first step of switching the critic is starting to get to know it and seeing how active it is. Mm. And then stepping in. And when we see it or hear it, then stopping it and saying, thank you for sharing. And what's another perspective I could hold here? It's an intense, ongoing work, but it's such freeing work. So when you two met up, you decide immediately, hey, um, we're going to start this place and help young women (laughs) overcome what we've just come through? Uh, I will just speak for myself. I had absolutely no idea that this is what we would be, or I would be doing this many years later. It's been over 20 years. and I guess the need's still out there, huh? (laughs) Yes. Yeah, but I mean, there's, you know, we hadn't thought about doing a nonprofit, and we hadn't thought about writing books, and we hadn't thought about being, you know, on a podcast or on TV or... We were just, um, you know, found a way to sort of recover ourselves and saw the need and tried to fill it because nobody else was doing this. And both of us looked very hard for other people doing this so that 
we could go there or that we could send people we know there, but there wasn't. So we created it. And how long ago was that? Uh, 22 years, 23 years from the very first time, you know, that we had one little group and that's what we did. We just did that one little group. How did you put the word out for that first group? Uh, well, I had, uh, several women who really wanted to do this. And, um, when I would tell them how, what happened to me, they would want to do it, or they would know a girl or a woman that wanted to do that. Or, and when you say wanted to do that, it's like do free this themselves group. of, yeah. Just, and like, I'd like to be done with this already. This is what I, I've been looking for. You know, I want to do it. And I had a, a friend who was a nutritionist and she said, What you're talking about is every one of my women clients. I mean, they all do this. They all hate their bodies. They all overeat. They all can't stand themselves. And so, um, you know, so that's where we pulled from that for a while. And then, I don't know, we just got lucky and we got a lot of press and just, we just kept following the path, really. That's. Did you guys have (laughs) professional training and counseling and therapy when you started the groups? So when I met Laura Lee, I was an intern. I, through my own recovery, I was on a track to being an economic forecaster for Pacific Bell. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) And when I started my own recovery, I just collapsed and then realized that this was really important work. And so I went back to school to become a licensed marriage family therapist. When I let Laura Lee, when I met Laura Lee, she was doing the group with a nutritionist who, who left. And so we got together. And then Laura Lee went back to school and became a, a clinical hypnotherapist. And Right. And before that, I was a hairdresser for many years, which I still cut hair today. And that is a lot of people right there that are having a struggle. Wow. <laughs> right. It's amazing. Um, you guys will never be out of business, unfortunately. And I'm thinking, I, you know, I'm the same age as you guys. And when I was in college, you know, the women's movement was starting and I swear I I would have been stunned if anyone told me this many years after the fact we would still be talking about these issues. And yes. I get these emails yes. from these 12 and 14 year olds. I'm yes. saying Is this a time warp? I mean, did nothing happen? Did nothing happen? Tell me. Did anything happen well, that changed anything? I think what's so frightening is the progression of the extremeness of the companies around it. On the good side, there's been a movement of women and therapists and men and people in the field who understand the work and who are providing intervention. And then there's tons of inpatient treatment for eating disorder prevention programs. So that's the good news. The bad news is that the models now are so extremely thin. The rate of plastic surgery for teenagers is huge. Bulimia has tripled in the past 20 years, the rate of bulimia. Anorexia is rising. So the messages we're getting are more extreme. The pressures are more extreme. The images are more extreme. The media is so intrusive now for young people. It's everywhere. So, you know, the the shadow and the light side are both growing. <laughs> but, yeah. do you, but do you think that the inpatient treatment, these programs, what kind of model are they following? Is it pure behavior modification? What I'm reading is that Eating disorders are very, very difficult to combat. Yeah, they are. And the fact that people don't even say that they're cured, but I read that you guys say that you are. So why aren't those treatment facilities that probably charge thousands and thousands a week hip to what you're doing? Well, many are. There are many very good solid treatment centers out there. And 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 they have good recovery rates. That have good recovery. It's a problem with a treatment center is that you can't afford to go for a year, two years, three years, ten years. And this recovery is a slow process because, especially for some individuals, they've been doing this obsession ever since they were ten years old. Our identity, when we're very young in this culture, gets wrapped around being thin. And our relationship to food gets formed in our early, early childhood years. So it takes many years to recover, as it took many years to create it. Right. And I'm I'm thinking about what you were just saying about this treatment 
Like Carol, I agree. There's many, many treatments out there that are treatment centers that are very good. But you also have to remember that in this day and age of not very uh, good medical insurance, there's thousands of people who need to be in treatment, but just their insurance, frankly, doesn't cover it. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way it is. And also, there's not a medical model to treat this. They can't just give somebody a pill and it clears up. It is, like Carol's saying, it's it's an unfolding. And so somebody has to have a lot of support to walk against the tide that is telling them that what they're doing is not right. What they need to be doing is being on a diet. More control, not less control. So let's talk about prevention then. Since you know there will always be a huge backlog of people who need treatment, when I think about tweens and teens or girls nine and ten year olds mm-hmm. what what can parents be doing, moms in particular, mm-hmm. to prevent these kind of messages? How can they help their girls so that they don't get to the point where three or four years down the road they're um beating themselves up for what they see in the mirror. Well, I think that the biggest thing that we can do as parents is model a different behavior, a different idea to our daughters and our sons. Model that the love of the body and the trust in the body, the trust in the self, rather than model, I hate my thighs, (laughs) you know, and I just want to go back because there's something that you said a minute ago that, that, you know, it doesn't seem to stop. And again, when I was a model, I was 12 years old. This is in the early 60s. And they were putting the models on diets because the models weren't under 100 pounds. The movie America the Beauty, the Beautiful, shows a model who is 12 years old, 13 years old. And as she starts to develop, she's very, very thin. As she starts to develop, she's told if she wants to continue to model, she has to more or less lose some weight. So that we're doing this uh, 30, 40 years later, like you, I'm appalled that we're still doing that. I'm appalled that this is still what we're doing. So I agree with you. I mean, I think that, and that, bleeds into all of us, all of the women, all of the men, all over the place. And so we think maybe you're not supposed to weigh under 100 pounds, but you're certainly supposed to be pretty thin. And you're not supposed to be round and cellulite and wiggly and jiggly. You know, you're just not. Not supposed to. So these are unrealistic expectations yes. and goals. Yes. The ideal is perfection and nobody is that. And I saw enough of the trailer for America the Beautiful to see how the computer helps enhance these images so even what we think is perfect That's right. is not human. Right. And it just seems to me that there's a cyclical thing here. And we're feeding our boys these images as well. I did a, um, a training, an eighth grade training about healthy relationships and put a question up an open-ended question, what is a good reason to end a relationship? And there were about 120 boys and girls, all eighth graders in there. And they were using post-its to put anonymous responses to it so that they would be free to answer. And they were moving around the room so no one could see. And when we collected them, several of the responses, I have to guess, came from boys, though I don't, that's an assumption, What's a good reason to end a relationship? If your girlfriend gets too fat. Mm -hmm. This came up a lot on those post-its. Yes. And the principal had seen them ahead of time and wanted to know, you know, should I I leave this? I said, oh, no, leave them. I want to talk about this as a group. And we did. And I have to say, the girls were not incensed. They tittered as if... They agreed that that yes. would be a good reason to get dumped. And God, I as an eighth grader, I'm never going to let myself be in that position. So if the girls are not willing to, to be assertive and stand up for who they are, you can't blame the boys. Well, who, where would they learn that from? Exactly. I mean, they can't. 
Again, they see that it is their fault if they don't get a boy. And what's the first thing you can look at? Well, my body's not yeah, right. I'm too fat. Right. Um, I mean, again, it's it's just an insane situation to put on these young. I mean, you're already weirded out at, <laughs> at these ages, just, you know, going through your little life. But now to add this perfectionistic attitude about your body and it just, it's overwhelming. And, and if that's what you're modeled, even if your parents are the best parents in the world and never say anything, you walk outside the door and it's everywhere. It's everywhere. The woman's the body is, is used to sell uh, cars and beer and everything else in the, that you can think of. It's never held in respect or honor or like Carol was saying, sacredness. In, until our culture and government is really willing to acknowledge that we are a fat phobic, fat discriminating society, then we won't be able to have a concentrated intervention. And it will have to be a grassroots movement, which is tough when a lot of the money that's fueling this is being made in the diet industry and the cosmetic industry and the magazine industry. So it, it's a huge uphill battle. But, you know, our country has fought all kinds of racism and issues like that, and we've come through. But the question, my fear is, how bad does it have to get? Because as I work with many young teenagers, mostly women, but some men, who should be having the time of their life, but are struggling in the hospital for their life. And I see it happening more and more. We're on a we're on a frightening trend, and yet on the other side of it, you see the ep the epidemic of obesity here, which is certainly not healthy, and I don't know enough about the physiological aspects of it, but it would seem to me, in part, that those people are certainly they're demonized in the way that everyone who doesn't fit this perfect mold is demonized, and then they've got the extra health issues that go with a lot of those kinds of situations. I'm sure that there is a frustration on the part of parents who might be listening to this, who are saying, okay, well, on the one hand, I certainly don't want my kid to be too thin or to be too obsessed. But on the other hand, I don't want them to just think that they can, you know, eat anything and be unhealthy. So as a, as a mom, I'm listening to you guys and I'm thinking, do I push in this direction or that? And parents don't know what role they have. It's a very good question. Well, I was just going to say that there's a book called The Obes Obesity Myth. That's a fabulous book. And he talks about how the body mass index was created in a very skewed way. And that by that index, Arnold Schwarzenegger would be labeled as obese. And the frightening thing is that you have parents who are bringing their kids into physicians who are, when you look at the whole picture, they're in a state of developmental change, they're active, their nutrition is good, and they're weighed and they're told they're overweight and they need to be put on a diet. So we've got a very complex issue in our culture where we have a rise in obesity, although you can't necessarily trust the, the figures on that because of the skewed perspective about what obesity is. And it's complex in terms of us not getting out and moving naturally and the type of foods that we're eating, the processed foods and all those pieces. Then we have people who are not necessarily obese, but are being treated as obese. And so their food's being restricted and they're feeling shame. And so then they start this process of dieting and then binging, which can lead to eating disorders. And then we have people who are so afraid of being fat that they're binging and purging or restricting and willing to kill themselves because they'd rather die than be fat. So it, it's a very complex issue. And, and for parents, I think there's layers of things they can do. I think the first thing parents need to do is to be able to look at their own issues around food and weight and heal them. Because whatever isn't healed is going to be leaked down to their kids. To be clear about not making any negative comments about their body or their children's body. To mirror a lifestyle of eating a variety of foods. To mirror the ability to stop when you're full or identify when you're hungry and, and experiment with what's 
satisfying to them, to mirror getting out and doing healthy exercise that they enjoy and that's fun and that's intuitive, and not from a perspective of, you need to do this to lose weight, but we do this because we enjoy it as a family. And to educate our kids about fatism and the judgment out there that they will see and experience and how important it is to protect themselves and their peers from that. And to critically think about the media, to understand that whatever image they see is not a real image and there's no way they can be that. Yes. Well and <laughs> And, uh, you know, again, I'm just thinking of my own my own self here, my own story, which is my granddaughter is five years old. She's built like me, and I am built like my father's side of the family, tall and thin. That's how my, my son is also built like that. My, uh, my great niece is built more like my mother's side of the family, which are shorter and more petite and uh, kind of more curvy women in that side of the family. And so you put those two girls together, they, one of them is very thin and one of them is just rounder. And both of them are just as healthy as they can be. But these are two different body types. And when I go to the store with them, the thin one gets all of the attention. And I'm not saying that the other one's not thin. I'm just saying in comparison, one looks perfect and one doesn't in the culture that we live in. How old are these girls now? Five and six. And they're both beautiful I'm and sure. healthy. And so you're the adult there, and here is this external opinion yes. coming to settle on these two girls, and yes. each of them take it in a certain way. What do you, as the protector, and one who has a message of much more positive, what do you do in a moment like that? What I do is I do not comment on either one of their body. I don't tell them that they look cute or they look beautiful. I tell them they are beautiful, but I don't comment on their body. And when someone else does? I just tell the person that's not helpful and move along. <laughs> I mean, but, and then I, I teach both of them when I'm around them, are you hungry? You know, you can have whatever you want. What is it that you want? Are you really hungry for that? Mm -hmm. And, um, or do you want to run and play? Do you want to move? You know, what do you want to do? So I try to keep them and take them back to their bodies. And I try to just not, I, I give them strokes, I guess you would say, for being funny and for being smart and for being a good person and for being thoughtful and, you know, and for being fast and for falling down and getting up and running on, you know? <laughs> so, and I, I might be the only person in these two little girls' life that does that, but at least they have one person who He's just so looks at them and sees a great being instead of, oh, she's got really beautiful long hair and bl yeah. big blue eyes. You know, I don't think like that for them. Let me ask you about the girls who graduate from your group. How many of them are inspired then to help their friends or their peers in some way continue on what they have learned about this very liberating process? Well, we've never done a, a study, a long-term study to look at that, but we have a few examples in our minds, like this young lady who went through the Body Positive program, which is a, a preventive, they, they focus on prevention. And she went off to college and started teaching women's issues class and brought this whole piece into it. Mm. So you can see how people's recovery, especially where I see it most is the women in our group who come in who are mothers. You can see so clearly how their recovery impacts their children in a positive way. But I work out at the Lagunitas Middle School and we've developed a program there over the last eight years where we take the eighth grade girls we teach them eating disorder prevention, and then at the end of the year, they do a workshop with the fifth grade girls and mentor them. And in this process, this year, one of the things that the girls did was they did a group educating the boys about the body image issue, and they had this conversation about the dialogue. And they've learned to create a community where if they hear one or the other speak up and say, oh, I hate my body, or oh, I'm too fat, they say, you know what? 
we don't do that, remember? You know, they've, they've created a small community to support each other. And I just think that's the only way to do it, is to start creating small communities who get it. In every school. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In every school. And the other thing that uh, we have a peer education program, something very similar to what Carol is talking about, where we teach older girls how to go into schools and teach prevention. And um, I'm thinking of somebody who did go through our program and then became one of our peer educators and to go back into the very schools that she was going to, to tell girls that were much younger than her about it. And so I, I agree with Carol. I mean, it's the thing that's so great about the teens is that once they get this, they get it. It, you know, they don't have 30 years of, <laughs> of yeah. uh, decisions about their bodies that mm-hmm. are, you know, that need to be changed. They've only got a few years. So they, they can turn it around pretty well. It's a miracle to watch it once they get it. I mean, they're just, you can't stop them. Well, they're so grateful to be on the other side of this or be out from under this burden. Yeah. Because it's, it, when you say it, it's an obsession and it takes over everything. Right. And, and it also kills people. Yeah. There's a lot of people who die from this and it's not on the death certificate. What's on the death certificate is a stroke or heart attack or whatever, but it's not, they don't put down eating disorders. Mm. They don't put that down. There is a movement to get it started so that they are they are put down, the real reason, but it's not yet. And if that were the case, then maybe some insurance companies Absolutely. would start to cover Absolutely. Right. prevention and treatment. Right. Um, I have the book for teens called Over It, A Teen's Guide to Getting Beyond Obsessions with Food and Weight. And my guests have been Carol Normandy and Laura Lee Rourke. Tell me, please, the title of the book for adults. The title of the book for adults is It's Not About Food, End Your Obsession with Food and Weight. And we've just come out with the revised and expanded version. (laughs) Where we actually talk about the whole obesity craziness. (laughs) Good. In the culture. So we, you know, that wasn't a big thing when we uh, wrote the other book 10 years ago. So it did come where this is just really hitting, you know, the scene right now. And so we try to address that in our own way that we do. I'd like to read that so I can educate myself about that. And tell me, where can our listeners get more information about your work? Beyond Hunger is located in San Rafael, and the website is www.beyondhunger.org. Phone number is 415-459-2270. And any of our books should be in local bookstores. If they're not, tell them to order it. Yes. (laughs) And And we can travel anywhere and give workshops and and uh, lead people in support groups and stuff like that. So. That was my next question for people yeah. who are not in the San Francisco Bay Area. Perhaps on your website you might have some resources? Yes, we have a lot okay. of resources, and we're also a resource source. People email us or call us, and we try to get information to them. But like I said, you know, it's not unheard of for Carol and I to travel and do a two-day workshop in another area. So... Um, you know, at least we get them set up and then they can continue on themselves. Wonderful. And the most important thing is that if you are struggling with an eating disorder or obsession about your food or weight, it's really important to get out and under the shame for it and get help because there are millions of women who are struggling with this. It's something that we've learned, it's something that we've internalized, and you can recover. You can end your obsession and you can live a very full, vibrant life. And pass on good messages to the young people in your yes. life. Absolutely. Yes. Great. And you don't have to have this the rest of your life. You do not have to be obsessed with food and weight the rest of your life. It just, it just doesn't have to be there anymore. Sounds good. Thank you both very much for being here. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Annie Fox for Family Confidential. For more information about my work with tweens, teens, and parents, visit AnnieFox.com. And tune in next time when my guest, Robert Rummel Hudson, will discuss his new book, Skylar's Monster, A Father's Journey with His Wordless Daughter. Till then, happy parenting. Happy parenting.